Uh, good to see you all this morning, and uh, we've got some uh, folks visiting, but again, in the main service, we'll mention that and uh, make sure we get around and welcome each other and make everyone feel at home in God's house. Amen? Oh, that's my grandson. He started already. Oh, and that's broken. <laughs> anyway. All right, let's, uh, let's open up in a word of prayer. I might ask, uh, let me see, Brother Clive, would you open the service in a word of prayer, please? Thanks. Amen. Thank you, brother. Let's go to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9 this morning. And again, the notes that you have, there's no, there's no fill-ins. We, we did start out with doing fill-ins, but it's like I, I uh, finished my schooling time at ACE and it was all fill-in stuff and I'm like, sorry if you use ACE. What, what, uh, you use ACE? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you do too? Yeah. ACE, Accelerated Christian Education. So, uh, yeah, that's how we, uh, we had the fill-ins. So I thought, you know, being an adult Bible class, we don't really need to, have, I don't know, you know what I mean? Just write your own notes. If you come to Bible Institute next year, it'll be that. Take your notes. Don't, uh, don't rely on the fill-ins. <laughs> Take your own notes. Anyway, all right, Revelation chapter 9. And uh, when we finished up last week, it closed up in chapter 8 and verse number 13. He says, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe. So uh, that's uh, ominous, isn't it? What's about to take place from here on. We've already gone through the first four trumpets uh, that have been blown and things have been happening. Uh, I also believe this, and we might look at it later, that the trumpets and the vials run concurrently. When the trumpet sounds and things happen, the vials also are poured out as well. But we'll look at that later on, and uh, we can make some references next to our verses uh, when we get up to that part. But uh, now we've got these three woes happening with these next three trumpets. And uh, let's look at chapter 9 and verse number 1. It says, The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and... To him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Who is this star? And no, it's not me. I know I'm a star, but it's not me. What's the star? Who's the star? Jesus is the star. He's the star. Okay. Uh, there's a couple. Yeah, he's, the, he's there later on. He's there later on, the Abaddon, but it, he's an angel. Uh, he's an angel. Remember when uh, we read later on that when Satan rebelled in heaven, his tail drew a third part of the stars with him? Well, that third part of the stars was the third part of the angelic host. All right, third part of the angelic host that fell with him. All right. So, if you believe it's Jesus, uh, it would be a capital S, I would say, if it was Jesus. Uh, we know that he's the bright and morning star. We get that. But I believe this is an angel because what we see later on is that the same angel binds Satan with a chain and throws him into the bottomless pit. Uh, this angel has a key. Now, I want you to look at something important because when we see keys here, we think of authority to unlock. Now, we know that Jesus said, if we go back to Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, we know that Jesus holds the keys. All right, he holds those keys. And he also, if you, we'll look at some other scripture in a minute, in Matthew, he, Jesus also said to Peter that he had the keys. All right, so a key speaks of authority to be able to unlock or lock, to open and shut. Okay, so if you look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, Jesus said this, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. All right, so there's no doubt that we know that Jesus has these set of keys. All right, and isn't it interesting in Christianity, we like to talk about the three keys to success or the four keys to this and the five keys. So we've all probably got big, massive bunch of keys on our uh, spiritual key ring. But Jesus said that he had the keys of hell and death. But we also know that according to scripture, we know that Jesus delegates power and authority to those on earth or to those that are in heaven also. So if, for example, if you look at first, uh, no, let's go to Matthew 16, Matthew 16. All right, Matthew 16. 
in Matthew 16, this is where we read of Jesus talking to Peter about giving the keys. And it's not just Peter that had these keys also. I believe that the context that he's talking about in Matthew 16, he's dealing with the church. And uh, you understand this morning that on this earth, though there are things going on, he has not left his church without any kind of authority. And the important thing about that is though we live in a spiritually wicked day, uh, we don't have to let the spiritual wickedness overrun us. All right, we don't, have to, we don't have to let that happen. So let's have a look at Matthew 16. Jesus said in verse 17, Jesus answered and said unto him, this is Peter, Simon Peter, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. He's talking about the confession when Jesus said, But who do you say that I am? And Peter confessed and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So he received that from heaven. Look at verse 18. I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uh, and then he says, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So he gave Peter uh, this authority or these keys to be able to bind and loose, bind and loose. Has anyone heard about praying, binding and loosing prayers? When you pray, you can bind when you pray. This is what he's talking about when he's been given the keys here. A lot of people, a lot of Christians get a little bit nervous when you talk about spiritual warfare and what's happening in the heavenlies and what we can and what we cannot do. Uh, but I also believe that as Christians through prayer, we have, uh, uh, we have the ability through the power and authority that Jesus has given unto us as his church to be able to bind and loose. This is why I don't believe Satan or his, or his demons can have total control over us while we're doing the work of God. Now, Paul said, don't give place to the devil. All right, don't give place to him. In other words, we, we can open up doors, if you please, for the devil to get into our home. This is why we've got to be very careful about what we watch, what we uh, read, what we listen to, what we allow our, the games our kids to play and so on. We've got to be very careful with all of that. Because he just looks for a foothold. He looks for a way to be able to get in. I was talking to Brother Craig the other day. I mean, you know, when you think about revival and people who are excited and loving the Lord and things happening in their life and uh, churches growing and so on and so forth, we all rejoice at that. But where a work of God is, Satan's not far away. And we've got to be, we've got to be open to that. So he says to Peter, I don't believe he's just talking to Peter as an individual. I believe he's talking to him because he talks about, uh, building the church here and giving him these keys of the kingdom of heaven, binding and loosing. You just, listen, if you've never, if you've never prayed prayers claiming the blood of Jesus or using, you know, the name of Jesus is just not a name that you tack on when you finished your prayer. Or when you're praying over your food, you know, Lord, we just thank you for this food in Jesus' name. And oftentimes we, we, just, uh, we just say it because that's what we're saying. Listen, there's power in the name of Jesus. And we ought to be using that name. We ought to be praying over our families. We ought to be praying over our children, our homes and work situations and all sorts because... A, Christ has given us the keys, he's given us the ability, he's given us the power and the authority to do what we need to do on this earth. We should never allow Satan into our homes or into our lives per se or even into our homes to ride roughshod and give us a hard time. For example, let's go to Mark chapter 13 for a minute. Mark chapter 13. Mark 13. In Mark 13, which is uh, Mark's account of Jesus giving us the events of the last days, all right, in Mark 13. And there's going to be some stuff happening, isn't there? I mean, there's already stuff happening in the world today for those who are switched on and who, know, who knows what's taking place. And he says in Mark 13, again, let's look, at, look at verse number 24 to start with. He says, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. The stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then thou shalt see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. We, 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 most of us are very familiar with that, but then he goes on and gives a few parables in verse number 28, dealing with what's going to take place. Verse 32, he says, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, know not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house, now watch this, and gave authority to his servants. 
and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. So what did Jesus give his servant? Are we, now we're sons and daughters in Christ, but are we not servants also? So what did Jesus give us as his servants during the last days? Authority. All right. Now, it's up to you whether you want to use it or not. Now, the authority is not in your name. The authority is not in your ability or your power or whatever. The authority is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever wondered why just some things are not happening and stuff happening in families and so on? Listen, it's time to be bold in our approach to the throne. It's time. He said, come boldly. It's time to be bold in approaching things that we just, this is unusual. This is not right. What's ta- well, have you, t- have you taken the authority that Jesus has delegated to you and used it in the spiritual realm? Now, a lot of Baptists don't like thinking about that. The Pentecostals will talk about it and they'll go one way and probably go too far one way. Well, Baptists, what we don't, what we don't like to talk about is the subject of spiritual warfare or spiritual gifts or anything that's, uh, supernatural and spectacular. And we tend to run the other way and the pendulum shifts the other way, but we've got to find a balance. We've got to find a balance. And the balance is this, is that while we're here on this earth, he has not left us without power. He's not left us just to succumb to the things that are taking place in this world. Take the name of Jesus and use it with authority in your praying over different situations. Because the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth. So Jesus tells Peter... I've given you the keys to the kingdom. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you bind in heaven shall be, shall be loosed on earth. Again, study it out. Have a, look at, have a look at spiritual warfare. See what's taking place in the scriptures here. Okay, So he delegates this power and authority under us. Have a look at, uh, I think it's Luke chapter 10. Go to Luke chapter 10, I think it is, while I'm on this, uh, while I'm on this sort of... Uh, Oh, yeah, Luke chapter 10. I remember Luke chapter 10 because I got in trouble in Bible college about this. And uh, it's always stuck with me. My, uh, my Bible college notes had lots of red marks, red pen and circles and all sorts. And, and uh, we were talking about this subject in Bible. This is going back some time. And, and the lecturer, uh, what can I say, really didn't like what was said. Anyway, doesn't matter. Look at Luke chapter 10, look at verse number, number 1. And after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whether he himself would come. Right? So he sends these 70 out, they preach the gospel, they see amazing things take place, Right? they see uh, uh, sick people getting well, they see devils subject to it. As a matter of fact, look at verse number 17, and this, <laughs> this is what got me into trouble. Verse 17, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, <laughs> let me just insert something. It's like the Lord saying, that's no biggie. All right, you know what I mean? That's so it's, it's like the Lord saying, that's not a big thing. Look at what he says. I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Now, do you think for a moment, and most, I would say 98%, of 98% evangelicals, Baptists would say, yeah, well, that was just for the 70. That's just for the 70. So in other words, those 70 had the ability that Jesus gave them to do things, but we, in the year 2024, we don't have any of that. We, we've just got to... We've just got to be trodden on and walked over and all this sort of stuff when it comes to the spirit realm. No way am I going to believe that. No way am I going to preach that. Now, this morning I'm preaching out of the book of Acts and most of my colleagues will say, well, you know, Acts is a transitional book and you can't do this and you can't do that. Listen, let me tell you something. Acts is not a transitional book. Never says it's a transitional book. Paul tells Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. As a matter of fact, if you want to talk transition, Jesus was the transition and the new covenant started when Jesus Christ died on the cross. And Acts is a continuing work of Christ through the person of the Holy Spirit through the church. 
And so what you see in Acts, it's not like, oh, well, you know, that's for them. Oh. No, no, no. Now, I get the fact that there were some special miracles that took place in Acts that we probably won't do, like Paul, like, like uh, you know, Paul uh, blessed uh, aprons and stuff and sent them out and people got healed and people like Oral Roberts. Remember Oral Roberts back in the day and all these other Pentecostals think that they can pray over these things and so on and so forth. I get the fact that we need to be discerning. However, what we're looking here in Acts or in passages like this is that Jesus Christ has given his people, his church, authority through his name on this earth. And if you don't want to use it, that's fine. Don't use it. But then don't worry when things take place. So he says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and on scorpions. And that's a metaphor for demons. Okay? And over all power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So I got into trouble when the lecturer said, see, Jesus told them that that they shouldn't be rejoicing in their authority that they have, but their names are written in heaven. And I said, he said, rather, he said in a greater way. He didn't say don't rejoice because of spiritual victory that you can have, but he's saying, you know, apart from that, you ought to be rather rejoicing that your names are written in heaven. And we, that's where we rejoice, right? But I tell you what, I'm rejoicing that my name's written in heaven, but I'm also glad that God, Jesus himself, has not left me without power on this earth. All right? He hasn't done that. So, does everyone get that? Go to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. Favorite psalm that so many people like to claim, that the psalm of protection. All right. Who knows? Who who remembers Psalm ninety one? Everyone knows Psalm ninety one, and and uh, there is, there are verses in here that I pray regularly over my family, have done for years, and I would encourage you to do likewise. I really would. When you read through Psalm ninety one, don't read it. Pray it. All right. Pray it. The key. To Psalm 91, when it comes to protection or power or authority, is in verse number 1, when he says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's the key. Abiding in Christ. Abiding under the shadow. Now, I have, unfortunately, in my life, walked out from underneath that. I don't believe you can lose your salvation. Amen. But there have been times where I've walked out underneath that, gone my own direction, walked my own path, and then find out that I'm in no man's land and all this stuff happening in my life. And then I'm like, why is all this happening? And it's like, well, hello, you've walked out under that umbrella of protection. And by the way, let me say this. The New Testament church is an umbrella of protection. It really is. All right. So let's have a look at Psalm 91 very quickly. And I'll tell you what. Most of us here would agree that we're going to experience some kind of tribulation before Jesus comes back. Am I right? Uh, we, want to, we want to know this. All right? We, we want to know this and we want to pray it and we want to claim it. All right? Verse 2, I'll say, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His name shall, uh, his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Hey, you've got to know the truth, folks. Amen. All right. Jesus said, "You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free." All right. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. Now we're not talking literal arrows here, but the, what about the fiery darts of the wicked? Remember Ephesians chapter six: the fiery darts of the wicked. Verse 6, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday, a thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. That sounds like Luke 10, didn't it? Nothing shall by any means hurt you. And you say, oh, but hang on a sec, Pastor. What about all these other people that get hurt and so on and so forth? Hey, I don't know the answers to every question, but there is a possibility that through ignorance of what we have in Christ, then people open themselves up to stuff. All right, We are responsible for what we know. 
So my job is to inform you. My job is to say, this is what the scriptures say. It's up to you whether you want to receive it. It's up to you whether you want to put it into practice and say, well, you know, that's, uh, that sounds really good, however. But again, the truth here that's in Psalm 91, we all should know it and claim it. There shall no evil before thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. What about when the big C was happening not that long ago? That the, uh, that the world wanted to ramp up. Did you see? I don't know. I was talk- we did some visits yesterday, visiting with Trace and I, with Craig and Loren, and then we caught up with Kim and Clive. And I was saying, Craig, because the West Australian had a, I think it was on the front page, talking about uh, the, the West Australian police want a public army to be able to basically dob in if anyone's doing stuff during the next pandemic. <laughs> the- I tell you, they've got a pandemic on the way. All right, they've got it. Now, what are we going to do as a church when the pandemic happens? Are we all going to scatter or are we going to keep assembling? Now, we might not be able to assemble here. All right, but you know what? You know, back in the day in Acts, people met in homes. So it may be that we're all going to someone's house and just bursting it, or it could be that groups are going to be meeting in homes. Yours is big enough. We could put a big tent. We could put a big tent. Yours, I think yours would be big enough by the sound of it. You better hurry up and get it fixed up, Brother Clive. Uh, but here's the thing. You don't know. You, there could be small groups meeting in homes and singing and praying and worshipping and hearing the word. Listen, there's more than one way to skin a cat. But you're going to have to be prepared for some backlash. All right? Going to have to be prepared. Now, again, get back to the West Australia Pay. So they, they're trying to cover their bases and they're going to be keeping an eye out. And if they see a whole heap of cars at someone's house and then they say, oh, hang on, someone's singing Christian songs and, man, they're shouting and praising and clapping. That's the Pentecostal church. Baptists don't do that. Uh, <laughs> You, uh, uh, surely there's someone meeting there. We better do- hey, hey, there's someone meeting at number 10, blah, 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 blah. You better come over quick. Now, Jesus actually talks about that in the last days. Talks about uh, the sons dobbing in the fathers and the mother-in-laws and so on and so forth. And uh, an enemy will be someone that's in your home. And all this sort of stuff's going to take place. But when it comes to pestilences or pandemics or whatever it is, do you know that we do not have to succumb to that if we know what the Bible has to say? All right? So then he goes on. They shall bear thee up. This is what I pray regularly for my children. And if you've got children, I would, I would pray it for them. Verse 11 and 12. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone, which is what Satan used out of context. Remember that? When he tempted Jesus. So I pray regularly, Lord, I thank you for giving your angels charge over my children to protect them in all their ways. Take the scripture and pray the scripture. You will not lose out by praying the word of God. An evangelist in America, some of you would have heard of him, uh, Scott Pauley. We all, some people have heard of Scott Pauley. Uh, he's an evangelist and he pray, when he reads his Bible, he just doesn't read it, tick a box. As he reads through it, he prays through it. He prays what he's reading and he, he just, and it says that the scriptures just come alive as he's opening the Bible and praying through it. So I want to encourage you, take these verses and pray them over your people. He's already said that he's going to give his angels charge over thee, which is why I say thank you, Lord for giving your angels charge over my family to keep them in all their ways. Now, I, the, the, I, we, now our kids are adults, but you never, you never stop worrying or being concerned for your kids, right? No matter how good a driver. My kids are driving up and down the Bruce Highway. Man, I pray for them. I pray for them, okay? Because you just never know what can take place. And I don't want anything to happen to my family through my negligence. Okay, that's just me. Verse 14, because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I'll set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I'll answer him and will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. Will I satisfy him and show him my salvation? So that's just a few instances that you read in your Bible where God himself has given power and authority and protection to those that are his. 
Listen, you can't walk in the flesh and claim the, the promises either, by the way. All right? You just can't walk in the flesh and expect God to say, well, you know, God, blah. No, he, he, he realizes, and we need to understand there's some responsibility that we need to take for our own life, right? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. All right, very good. <laughs> Appreciate that. So let's go back to Revelation 9. Revelation 9. So we see this star fall from heaven, right? And again, it looks like there's some uh, unsure who this star is. Let's have a look. So we're in Revelation. I want you to go to Revelation 16. Revelation 16. Oh, hang on. No, don't go to Revelation 6. I beg your pardon. Go to Revelation 20. Sorry. Look at verse 1. Revelation 21. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit. So it's the same angel that he's talking about back in chapter 9 there. All right. So he's got this key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years. All right. So I believe, and you, it's fine, you can believe whatever you want to believe, but I believe that this angel in Revelation 9 and verse 1 is the same one or the star here is the angel that is sent down. He's got the key to the bottomless pit. I believe the bottomless pit is hell. Okay. Some others might have a different opinion, but I believe the bottomless pit is hell. And what comes out of hell is just amazing. And I say that and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. What comes out of hell now comes on earth. So we, we have heard the old saying, hell on earth? Yeah, it's about to happen. All right, it's about to happen. Verse 2, And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And under them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not... The seal of God in their forehead. So remember last week we saw the 144,000 are sealed. All right, They've got the name of their God sealed in their forehead. So these locusts that are let out, and we'll have a look and see perhaps what they are, what they're not. Are they literal locusts or whatever? Uh, they can hurt all the other inhabitants of the earth except the ones that are sealed. All right. Verse number 5, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of scorpions when, a, when he striketh the man. Has anyone ever been stung by a scorpion, a wasp, or anything like that? Anything? Yeah, got a few nods. Yeah. Apparently it's painful. Uh, when, I, when I used to live in the bush, you had scorpions and you used to have to check your boots every time you get up in the morning and make sure you tip them up and make sure there's nothing in there that shouldn't be in there. You probably might have some up on the block there, John, something like that. Hey, I tell you, apparently it's painful. All right, So there's going to be some pain inflicted upon the inhabitants of the earth for five months. Five months. Now, remember, we're not here for this, right? Amen? All right, we're not here for this. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. Does that sort of, what sort of picture does that paint in your mind? If you think about it, there are those who are going to seek death. How does, let me ask you, how does that happen? What does it mean to seek death? Does anyone know? They want to die. That's right. So do you think there could be uh, an abundance of uh, attempted suicides? Right? Now, I don't want to get too graphic because we've got young ears here, right? But, it, you know, there are a lot of different ways that people try and take their own life. Now we've got assisted death or dying and all this sort of stuff, which is not right. 
Um, you got injections. You got other means, hangings, and all that sort of stuff. So you've got all these people that are going to try and find death, if you please, and it's going to escape them. Just stop and think about that for a minute. How many people are going to attempt something but it doesn't work? Many years ago, when we were living in Adelaide, I got up early one morning and walked out the back and uh, the backyard neighbour had taken his own life in the tree. And uh, it was... Uh, mm. If someone tries to do that during this time, they're not, going to find, they're not going to find death. So do you think that possibly there's going to be a lot of disfigurement? There's going to be a lot of... I tell you, it's... it's now, we know that the Simpsons on TV prophesy a lot of things, right? <laughs> but Hollywood... Hollywood is a prophetic voice when it comes to the enemy. Why is it in Hollywood there's so many things now about uh, the Walking Dead? All that sort of... Ever, now, I know all of you are real spiritual. You don't watch TV. I get that. We grew up in a day where TV was of the devil. We weren't allowed to watch it, but we were rebellious. Still are. Uh, got a few TVs. But you've got the Walking Dead series. You've got a lot of... Uh, of all that sort of stuff, do you think that it's sort of saying what possibly is going to happen? Possible. All right, I better stop there because I can get pretty graphic and I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. So we've got this thing that's happening on earth now, the trumpet, this, this trumpet's opened up, the fifth trumpet. We've got all this stuff happening. Describes these locusts. They had hair, verse 8, as the hair of women and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. They had breastplates. Uh, on them of iron, the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots and many horses running to, as many horses running to battle. Let me ask you a question, and again, there's no right or wrong answer. Do you believe that these are literal locusts? Or do you think that John is describing something here that if we were to stop and think for a moment, now I like war history, I like history in general, but I like war history, and the, the, the war that I like to study the most is the Vietnam War, maybe because it was so... Uh, you know, political, political. Uh, you have Apache uh, helicopters now or, you know, those gunships that they call where they've got the machine guns and the rockets flying out. And Is it possible that this is what John is describing here? That these are not literal locusts, but this is, uh, again, he's using terminology to paint a picture. If you think about the end times and the possibility of nuclear war and armies, and we see it all over the world that armies are gathering, and you know, you look at these armies, you've got the helicopters, you've got the tanks, you've got all this sort of stuff. Is it possible that what John is describing here, and he's talking about locusts, and he's talking about things, fire coming out, and all this, is it possible that he's talking about those things? It's a possibility. I'm just saying it's a possibility. Verse 10, they had tails like under scorpions and their stings were in their tails and their power was to hurt men five months. All right. So we know when we look at the first four trumpets, it's like they came in succession. One, two, three, four. Now you've got this one here that, that the, the uh, result of this trumpet extends out to five months. And if you understand this, we know that things are rapidly coming to a complete end. All right. Now, who here believes that there's still going to be some folks that survive this and they go into the millennial reign? There's a lot of there's a lot of different there's a lot of different ideas here because why? Here's a question: If Christians are the only ones that go into the millennium with Christ to rule and reign with a rod of iron, why does Jesus have to rule and reign with a rod of iron if everyone who's in the millennial reign are born again believers? True. Yep, it's exactly right. Hey. They won't get any rain. 
Okay, yes. Anyone else got something they would like? No, no right or wrong question. Just putting it out there, just getting some discussion. I, I had that question a long time ago. It's like, okay, if, if we as believers... Now, every... And, and again, there's people that's going to be born during that time. Okay. Yep, absolutely. So whether you, whether you understand that at the end of these seven years there's still people alive who are going to transition into that and don't forget we rule and reign with Christ. We get cities that we get to look after and so on and so forth. That's what the scriptures say. But why would Jesus have to rule with a rod of iron if everybody in the millennium are born again? There's obviously going to be people there who are not Christians, right? who at the end of that thousand years, Satan deceives and gets to, to join him in one last hurrah against the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the Battle of Gog and Magog, right? So the Battle of Gog and Magog actually happened after the thousand years, not before. Who, who here hears on the news today that, oh, you know, the stuff between Russia and Ukraine, that's Gog and Magog and all this sort of stuff? No, it's not. Can't be. Can't be, because it happens after the millennial reign, all right? So... Good things to think about. Don't just read the script, just think about it. Ask questions. Ask questions. Verse 11. Now, here is the thing about this, uh, these locusts. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, and in the Greek tongue hath his name Polyon. Now, if you were to look at Proverbs chapter 30 and verse number 27, literal locusts don't have a king over them. Proverbs 30 verse 27 says they have no king. They know what to do. It's like it's programmed them. Now, coming from South Australia, I don't know about you guys from WA as well, we've had a number of different plagues, mice plagues. Have you ever been in a mice plague before? And then there's locusts, and the locust plagues come in through the wheat farms and, and so on. They destroy everything that's in its path. Everything. And they don't need a king to lead them about and go and do it. So when we look at this, we see that these locusts that are released from the bottomless pit, these ones have a king over them, and the Hebrew word for Abaddon is destruction. And the Greek word for Apollyon is destroyer. So this angel who has a name, his name is destroyer. And he's going to go about destroying. <laughs> And I went to Bible college to learn that. <laughs> is this person or is this angel mentioned perhaps anywhere else in the scriptures? Yeah. Oh, that was quick. Who said that? <laughs> You're on fire this morning, mate. Hey? You're on fire. All right. Yes. Let's have a look at Let's go to Exodus 12. What time is it? All right. We've got a few minutes. We're not going to finish these notes this morning. Let's go to Exodus 12. You know, if you, uh, if, you, if you leave here this morning after Bible class and you're talking about it and got questions, hey, that's great. That's really good. Let's go to Exodus 12. Anyone know what's happening in Exodus chapter 12? Passover. Passover. And we know what's happened prior to that. All the plagues. Frogs, locusts, so on, and all of that sort of wonderful things that Egypt went through, which the people of God who were in Goshen were protected from. Okay. Now notice something. Why was the Passover so important? Yep. So they had to find that lamb, they had to watch it, great picture and type of Jesus Christ, they had to kill it, take the blood, apply it to the doorpost, so that when the who? The, the death angel flew over. And we sing that song, I will pass over you. All right, That's where you get the name Passover from. So let's have a look at uh, Exodus chapter 12. Look at verse number 13. Exodus 12, 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses... Where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Right? Now look at verse number 23. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not, dis and watch this, and will not suffer the who? We will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. Is it possible? 
that in Revelation 9 where we see a, a, a Baden or a Polyon who is a destroyer, is it possible that this is the one? Do you know why God uses angels to do these things? Does anyone have an idea perhaps why God uses angels to do this? Sorry? Because he can. Okay, because he can. Well, that's true. He can. They don't feel. They've got no emotion. They've got no emotion. So when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed and the two angels went, they didn't like, oh, you know, well, this is terrible, this is bad. We look at death and we think, man, like, like what ha- happened at Bondi Junction yesterday, most people would be, are appalled at that and rightly so. Well, you know, when you look at what's happening in Revelation with the trumpets or you, t- you look at what's happening here in Exodus, the reason why angels are used is because they've got no emotion, they've got no whatever. God just sends them and bang, off they go. By the way... Evil angels, if you want to call them, evil spirits, even they are subject to the authority of God. So you talk about the sovereignty of God. He's sovereign even over all the spirits that are in heaven, all of those that are in the earth and under the earth. Right? He can tell them to do what he wants them to do. So we've got the destroyer here. All right? Let's have a look at Job. Go with me to the book of Job. We won't go through all of these. You can have a look at them when you get home if you want. Go through them, Job. Now, let me just say this. We've got some teachers here, homeschooling teachers. If you read my notes and you see things not spelled right and no capitals and no apostrophes or whatever, please, uh, I have others that correct me. It's their, it's their spiritual gift. All right. It's their spiritual gift. Pastor, did you see this? You didn't do this right. Oh, I know. I'm sorry. Look at Job 15 and look at verse number 21. Job 15, 21. Job 15, 21. A dreadful sound is in his ears. In prosperity, the destroyer shall come upon him. All right, again. Now, here is the thing about that. When people are in prosperity, it means this. Everything's going good. Everything's right. Home life's going good. Job's going well. Church is going good, you know, church is growing and all this sort of stuff. This is why as a pastor, I rejoice at what God is doing, but I'm also like in the back of my mind watching because I know the devil's not far away. Because while everybody's having a great time, while everybody's enjoying what's taking place, and that's good, it's in prosperity or when we least expect it, something's going to happen. That's why we all got to be on guard. Enjoy the victories. Enjoy the blessings. But don't become complacent. Don't become complacent, all right? So we've got a number of other different scriptures there that you can go through at home and have a look at that. I want to leave you with this, all right? Let me leave you with this. And I thought this really interesting as I was studying this out. Uh, If you go to the book of uh, Joel, go with me to the book of Joel for a second. Now, we know that the book of Joel is all about the day of the Lord, right? Amen? All right, good. Well done, class. Well done. Verse 1, 2, 1. But blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountain, a great people and strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many. Now look at what he says in chapter 2 and verse number 25. He says, And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. So we know, I believe in, uh, in what are we call uh, dual fulfilments, Right, where you see something in the Old Testament. Now, don't forget we talk about the abomination of desolation, right? So you go back to Daniel's time and you have uh, An- Antiochus or An- Epiphanes, that guy there comes in and into the temple and he desecrates it and so on, right? And then you've got AD 70. And in AD 70, uh, the, the, uh, the Roman leader Titus, who later became a Caesar, uh, who was part of the Jewish-Roman war that started in AD 66, finished in AD 73. AD 70 was the midpoint, right? What, uh, what Titus did, Titus was, um, 
was a leader of what they call the 15th Apollonian Legion. Now, the word Apollyon and Apollo have very similar connections, all right? Very similar connections. So when you see Apollo, he, Apollo is the Greek god, right? He's the Greek god of death and pestilence. Titus led the 15th Apollonian army. Apollo is the patron. And the locust, the locust was one of the holy animals that was uh, put on shields or whatever on flags, all right? The locust now. And so when he came in, and Joel talks about a great people coming in, and Titus was known as the destroyer, okay? And he destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70. And there was a reason why Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, because the Jews didn't want to accept that Jesus was the end of all sacrifices, he was the end of everything, and they still kept things happening and going and so on and so forth. So God allowed the Romans to come in and level the place, destroy it, okay? Notice something, that in that time, we, we, in Revelation 9, it mentions five months that these locusts are going to inflict pain. Titus besieged Jerusalem for five months. Five months was the length of time that he besieged Jerusalem. So it could be also that when you look at Joel, as Joel looks forward to this day of the Lord and what took place in AD 70, that was another fulfillment of an abomination of desolation. And there's going to be another one. I believe there's going to be another one. Whether that's the rebuilding of the temple, some don't believe there's going to be a rebuilding of the temple, some do. It's up to you what you want to believe. I tend to lean towards a rebuilding of a temple, and that's why it's an abomination, because again, they're rebuilding something and trying to uh, have the sacrifices come in and so on and so forth. That is an abomination to God. Okay, And so even when you look into the millennial reign, dispensationists will say, well, during the millennial reign, everyone's going to worship at the temple. And say, so, hey, no, 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 Jesus is the temple. Jesus is the one who, who paid all the, the, the price and he was the sacrifice and he was the fulfillment of everything. That's why we worship him. All right? So, so, very, what time is it? Oh, I've got I to gotta finish. I'm done. We might, look at, we might look at the altar and look at what's, oh, no, let me just say this because we'll, we'll get on. Let's, let's just very quickly, because it mentions, sorry folks. I never wanted to be a long-winded preacher, but I'll cut it short. Notice something in verse 15. When, when the, uh, the six angel sounds, all right, four angels are loosed from the river Euphrates and they are prepared for an hour, a day, a month and a year. God is very time conscious. Very time conscious. They're, they're, listen, no one's holding back what God's planned to do, all right, what's going to take place. A third part of men are going to be killed. Now, if you were to take the population of today, a third part of the world's population is 2.5 million people killed. That's a lot of people. Billion, billion sorry, billion, beg your pardon, 2.5 billion people. And then it mentions a number of an army of horsemen, which are 200,000, 000. I think that's 2 million, or uh, 200 million, 200 million. See, I, went, I did ACE, sorry about that. <laughs> You did too. There's a lot. Sorry, kids. You do ACs. That's good, 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 good. ACs. Anyway, what I'm saying is that is that that's a huge army and that's a lot of people dying. That's a lot of people dying. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. Lord, maybe lots to think about, lots to talk about, and that's a good thing. And it's important that we discuss what your word has to say. Bless our fellowship time now in Jesus' name.